All right, welcome everybody. Uh, I assume folks in the back can hear, can hear okay? Nice and clear back there? Wonderful. Uh, well, thank you all for attending this event. Um, this is really an opportunity to get folks together who have an interest in the formation of the cannabis industry in the future. Um, and I know we've got a ton of, uh, ton of insight and a ton of experience in this room, so it's really exciting. Again, the goal here is really to, uh, to exchange ideas, um, best practices, and really to have a way to collect information and data and put it in the hands of people who have the opportunity to help us make these changes as we form these things up and to help sort of fill in, you know, gaps with understanding of how this industry has worked in the past and, uh, you know, accomplishing some of the priorities of the board, including uh, getting legacy cultivators into the legal market. So, um, as I said and kind of put out there, this is really an informal panel discussion. Uh, we're going to go through and introduce all of our panelists and give a little context to uh, their respective roles in the cannabis industry, past, present, future. Um, and then we are also going to lead through a couple of topics. Um, cultivation, testing and pricing, licensure, uh, consumption and tourism. Uh, and really, that will be a part where it gets more interactive and where we'll go around uh, and give people a chance to throw out suggestions or recommendations. You know, how big should the tier be for an outdoor cultivator license? You know, 2,500 feet, 5,000 feet, uh, why? Um, so, we're really trying to collect information and beyond just this discussion, uh, there is a questionnaire that I put up on vermontawana.com uh, that has some survey information and that is very detailed. So that's a good opportunity whether you have a chance to speak here uh, directly or not uh, to have that input and know that it is going to get used. Those responses are all anonymous. Um, so please don't be shy about uh, filling that out and please do share that with other people. That's going to be open until the end of the month. So again, the idea here is that uh, we have a chance to impact the future of this before it happens. Imagine that. Um, instead of reacting, we get to be proactive here tonight and really talk about some good ideas with uh, the folks who have uh, the positions to make them happen and the experience and, and context to share with us. So, uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to go ahead and let each of our panelists introduce themselves briefly, uh, share a little bit about their background, uh, and then, like I said, we'll kind of get into a few of these discussion topics and. Um, in the meantime, feel free, record this, you know, stream this. Um, this will be, I don't know if we have any members of the media here, but um, please feel free to, uh, to introduce yourself. We have name tags there, or if you'd rather stay anonymous, that's fine too. So, uh, without further ado, I will go ahead and turn the mic over to our first panelist, Mr. James Pepper. Thanks for everyone for joining today. This is a great crowd. Um, my name is James Pepper. Um, I first started uh, being interested in cannabis policy um, when I really read the uh, 2013 RAND report um, and it indicated, one, that Vermont has some of the highest consumption rates um, in the country among um, both youth and adults and that, um, uh, you know, about a quarter of Vermont adults um, consume cannabis on a regular basis according to that report. That's um, by their definition in the last 30 days um, and that we also saw a lot of negative trends amongst uh, ease of access, uh, perception of harm amongst youth, and um, essentially we were seeing some positive outcomes from the states that had legalized cannabis. Um, at the time, uh, I worked with Senator Benning and Senator Sears and Tim Ash and Jeanette White um, in the Senate Judiciary Committee to craft a tax and regulate bill um, that made it through the Senate it kind of built on what was going on, the positive um, things that were happening in Colorado, Washington, and Oregon. And um, that bill was ultimately unsuccessful. I think it really did form the backbone of what we saw in Act 164, although Act 164 really was an improvement to what we did um, back in 2015. And um, since then, I worked for the Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs, um, really doing kind of legislative work, uh, trying to narrow the criminal justice pipeline, the entryway to that pipeline, trying to support people as they were coming out of the criminal justice system, um, and then also trying to reduce the impacts of criminal history records. Um, and uh, I went to DRE's Drug Recognition Expert School um, 
and uh, as a prosecutor, you can't get certified, but you can take the class um, just to see what that was all about, to see if it, that program had any efficacy. And um, let's see, I also served on Governor Scott's uh, Marijuana Advisory Commission on the Roadway Safety Subcommittee. And, uh, you know, when this opportunity to join the Cannabis Board arose, I thought it would be a nice kind of extension of the, the work and the policy work that I had done. Um, you might notice uh, in my biography that I don't have any cultivation experience. I don't have really strong cannabis background. And so I've been working as uh, diligently as I can to kind of meet the people that are in this industry and know the best practices, have a commitment to Vermont, have a commitment to the environment, and um, we're you know trying to get this right. And you know this is kind of, we're on the precipice of a brand new industry and the decisions that we make as a board are gonna have long-term impacts. And so you know, I'm very happy to see the commitment of Vermonters to helping the board understand um, what we're doing and make sure that you know, we, we, we take, um, take the kind of responsibility that we've been given very seriously. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Joe Benning. I'm a trial attorney by trade, and I normally stand in front of a jury, so that's why I'm standing now. Um, first, a question. How many of you are not from the Northeast Kingdom? I would like to sincerely welcome you to the real Vermont. Um, I don't say that just in jest. I'm very serious that the Northeast Kingdom is what Vermont was, and we take great pride in that. Um, I have served in the legislature since 2010, but as far as cannabis policy is concerned, my experience goes back to May of 1975. I was in high school as a senior, and I did not smoke marijuana. I went to a Catholic school. I would say about 60% of my colleagues did smoke marijuana. And I know I have to call it cannabis now, but I still refer to it as marijuana out of a reflex action. But my policy discussion begins when I was in a rock and roll band. Most of my band members partook. I just chose not to for whatever reason, and as a result, I never got invited to any of the good parties. They all thought that I was a narc working for the police, until the day that at a band practice, I walked out on the front porch of where we were practicing with a girl, and in between us was a dog. The dog lived in the house. The girl did not, I did not, and all of a sudden, the three of us, the girl, the dog, and me, were staring up the barrels of police shotguns. The house was raided, and I won't belabor you with the long story that began my experience with cannabis policy, but the upshot is I recognized from that moment in time that the United States was absolutely wrong in how it was approaching this subject. A long time later, after law school, I learned from that experience that uh, what the police were telling me wasn't exactly true, and I figured maybe I ought to go to law school and learn more about this, and I did. Graduated in 83 from Vermont Law School, managed to get elected to the Vermont State Senate in 2010 as a Republican, and one of my first actions was to file a bill that has led to expungement for the specific reason that I had to go through that same process in the state where I grew up, and Vermont had no expungement process at all. So if any of you have had experience with that, I know over 15,000 Vermonters have now had their records cleaned as a result of expungement, you're welcome. I worked very hard on that piece of legislation. I went from that point to deciding as a Republican to file an amendment to a bill that would bring a legalization of under two ounces. Keep in mind, this is the year 2011. Peter Shumlin is governor. I liken what happened next to dropping a hand grenade in the middle of this room and watching all of you scatter after somebody yells grenade because that's exactly what the Senate did. There were people who were fully in support but didn't want to say so. There were people who were diametrically opposed to it, and from there the conversation morphed into what you now have today. And I literally mean that, that we went from that simple attempt to where you are now looking at the potential for a tax and regulated system 
that makes sense and is perfectly legal. I serve on the Judiciary Committee. I'm chair of the Institutions Committee. On the Judiciary Committee, we traveled around the state to forums exactly like this, taking as much information from everybody we could imagine, from those in the police departments who are adamantly opposed to some of the best guerrilla farmers in the state of Vermont. I'm sure some of you are as well. The upshot is we took all the information we possibly could, and this forum tonight is a continuation of that process. I'm going to hand the baton off at this point, but I am happy to answer whatever questions you may have, and we are here, all of us, to listen to what you have to say and continue the conversation from my perspective in the legislature where we know this is going to have another conversation or two before we all get settled in. <laughs> Thank you very much, Senator Benning. Uh, my name is Timothy Fair. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to know actually quite a few of you uh, in the crowd, whether it's uh, through consulting or actually uh, working with you. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm the co-founder and managing partner of Vermont Cannabis Solutions. We're the only uh, cannabis law firm and consulting firm in the state. We currently are working with about 175 uh, soon-to-be cannabis businesses here in the state. And we certainly hope a good majority of them make it through the licensing process. Uh, we work primarily, most of those are small craft cultivators or those who are seeking a small craft cultivation license. But we also work with extractors, laboratories, uh, retail dispensaries, and I just got to say, it's an amazing, amazing thing being able to kind of see the birth of this industry here in Vermont. Um, seeing these projects go from the ether and people's dreams into actual tangible reality. Uh, and I want to thank Eli for having me on the panel today. I want to thank Jeremy Pepper from the uh, Cannabis Control Board, as well as Justin Dolan, who I will now let uh, introduce herself. back here. I'm a nurse. I specialize in maternal child health, and I did write down notes because I always forget to say everything I need to say. Talked to somebody on this panel before about that. Um, I also specialize in opioid use disorder and now cannabis therapeutics, and working in the opioid field for so long is one of the driving forces that brought me into cannabis medicine. I'm an herbalist, so I was doing herbalism before I became a nurse, so another kind of reason it makes sense. I'm a body and a birth worker. I'm the director of the American Cannabis Nurses Association, so that's a nationwide um, organization of nurses who are working to bring this to the mainstream, help break some stigma, educate others, especially healthcare providers, because healthcare providers don't get this information. Um, I'm also the founder of the Vermont Cannabis Nurses Association and the president of the American Nurses Association here in Vermont. So I chair the Nurse Legislative Advocacy Committee, so a lot of my work is starting to speak to legislators and trying to make change, and as Eli mentioned before, trying to work to make that change before it happens. So instead of waiting until things have already happened, we need to fix it. It's how do we get involved and have our voices heard ahead of time. Um, we also started a cannabis education program for healthcare professionals here in the state of Vermont because we recognize there's so much lack of information, unfortunately. I'm recently the clinical director of what's called Cannamommy Nonprofit, and the same thing we're working to help educate and break stigma in the, you're not working for my nonprofit. Can you guys hear me? Should I just talk louder? Just speak up. Raise, raise your hand, I guess, if you can't hear me, I'll talk, try to talk a little louder. Um, I'm also soon to be a published researcher at the University of Vermont, which is very exciting on cannabis and human milk feeding. I'm a hemp farmer as well, a clean grain certified hemp farmer, so that goes a little bit above and beyond the USDA organic program, so I'm always proud to kind of represent that and talk about the environmental stewardship and how important that is because we can't talk about medical or, or adult use cannabis without being concerned about what we're doing to our environment, right? Personally, I'm a cannabis patient. I've had over 40 surgeries. I have cow bone, pig bone, human bone, stem cells, titanium, and steel, literally holding my face together so that I can talk to you guys. Through all that different kind of medical conundrum, cannabis has definitely been my saving grace from my great grandmother helping me with cannabis as a kid into now. It's really made a big difference. I've been on a lot of other pharmaceuticals. That's why 
why as a nurse I feel it's so important to help other people. I'm a caregiver, which means I cultivate for another nurse who's in cancer remission who can't cultivate for herself physically, but also because her husband's in the military. So I'm about to be, um, or I shouldn't say I'm about to be, I'm, my son is about to get a medical card before he's 21 because of some chronic issues that he has. And unfortunately, the way the medical program here is in Vermont, I can't caregive for my son. So now I'm at a point where I'm looking for a caregiver for my son because I'm already caregiving for another nurse. So I'm really excited to be here to talk about policy, to help things change and move forward so I don't have a mom in my position saying, hey, I can't caregive for my child at this point because otherwise I want to put my kid on opioids all the time, right? So i um, happy to be here. Um, happy to be here again. Um, the other thing I didn't mention, I have a genetic and autoimmune disorder, so without cannabis, my life would really be absolutely different. If I can ever help people and patients, I offer free consultations, I talk to Vermonters all the time. I do feel we need more education and more medical support, and I strongly feel that all adult use oftentimes is medical use. We just have to kind of wrap our heads around it differently, because if someone's using that instead of alcohol or Ambien to go to sleep, well, then let's talk to them and how to support them that clean cannabis and use it as safely and efficiently as they can. So, so thanks um, for having me. I'm always here for questions today or afterwards. The Vermont Cannabis Nurse Association, reach out to us. We'll help educate you, and we work really hard to help donate cannabis from wonderful farmers like you guys who have surplus to patients in need that can't afford it. Right. Um, so, round of applause for all of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'm just going to stand in front of the microphone and project while we get the batteries changed out here for people. So, um, hopefully, you all thank can hear you me. to our panel and a big thank you to Burke for hosting us. Um, one thing we're going to talk about is consumption and tourism, and this is such a good venue to talk and think about this because they also have all the <coughs> weddings and events happening, um, and cannabis is ever present in that. But um, before we get to talking about that, uh, the cannabis and tourism section, we kind of wanted to start, we had a few topics that we put out, and again, this survey on vermontawanted.com kind of goes through this with some specifics. Um, and the first one is cultivation which I know that's important to a lot of folks in this room. And just to sort of back up right now as far as what we know about licensing, that we have a cultivation license, but we're not sure kind of yet what those tiers are going to be. We have a small cultivator license for a thousand square feet. We don't know exactly what that's gonna look like as far as, you know, especially the outside implications. So, um, you know, that's something that I know is a, a big point of interest for a lot of folks here who are uh, conventional farmers. And I'm curious, just by a show of hands, if anybody here, you know, considers himself a conventional farmer or farms things other than cannabis as well. So we have a, okay, good. Decent, decent, decent scattering. Um, so that's kind of what we want to talk about with the topic of cultivation. You know, sizing of, of licenses, um, we're going to talk a little bit about sort of pricing and tiers, but I thought a good way to sort of start would be to go through each of our panelists and Commissioner Pepper's got the, the, got the hard part of sort of, he's got to summarize everything that's out there right now with the caveat that we don't know exactly how things are going to shape up because right now we have subcommittees, we have a full advisory board, we have the full commission and it's fully staffed, um, although understaffed in the amount of work that they have to do. Um, but we know kind of who the groups are that are going to be putting this together and now it's time to start putting the meat on some of the bones. So um, I'll kick it to Commissioner Pepper first and we'll have a microphone here for you shortly. So do your best in the meantime thus far and sort of what's, what's yet to be determined. Um, and sort of, you know, again, for people here who want to be proactive, uh, you know, what are some of the questions that are facing the board? Really, I think the idea is to kind of put people in your shoes and think about sort of collectively, what are these issues that we have to work through? So um, we'll talk a little about testing and tracking afterwards, but just sort of cultivation and talking about license types, tier sizes, uh, where are we where are we at right now? And sort of what are the biggest challenges moving forward? Sure. Yes, this is the important part. There you go. So the board has been given a good amount of discretion to set the landscape for cultivator licenses. Uh, by statute, there is a small cultivator that is defined as a thousand square feet of flowering canopy. Um, and we've been given a direct, um, explicit directive to 
prioritize small cultivators and make specific exemptions to small cultivators to have them um, uh, to welcome them into the to shift them into the regulated market and what that looks like we don't know quite yet what we're going to think about is some of the kind of regulatory compliance on the environmental and energy side see what that looks like i mean there are of course environmental and energy minimums that are set you know through the agency of regulation i mean agency of natural resources rules and regulations um, and so what we want to do is kind of think about how many small cultivators there are in Vermont currently, what the demand is going to be, try to estimate the demand, see how much of that can be accommodated by small cultivators if we had an unlimited number of small cultivator licenses, and then see how, what other types of licenses we might need in order to meet the rest of the demand. And I should say that the other type of license that is defined um, is an integrated license, and the legislation that was passed give some priority to the existing dispensaries um, to hold integrated licenses. And um, you know, they're, uh, they're, they get the same sort of priority as some of the small cultivators and when they're allowed to start um, opening shops and start getting their licenses granted. Um, but really, uh, you know, what we're doing right now as a board is we hired a consulting firm to look at all of our tourism data, all of our parks and recreation data, um, all of our medical data, um, look at basket sizes at the, at the dispensaries, um, and try and estimate how much demand for cannabis we should expect, and then uh, build out our licensing structure um, to kind of hopefully match uh, the cultivation and um, we, so we know how much, we, how much product we need to cultivate. Um, and, uh, you know, I think what we are going to do first is kind of create a bare bone structure of a um, tiering system and then really start to get creative on different types of licenses that will allow us to kind of build upon Vermont's competitive advantages um, that we see. Craft cultivation licenses, cooperative licenses, um, things that allow for kind of decreased barriers to entry and allow us to kind of honor the Vermont tradition of kind of craft and local cultivation. So we'll kind of just, like I said, go down through each topic and uh, in, invite our panelists sort of just weigh in broadly on the on the topic of cultivation. And um, I won't chime in between each one of you and encourage you guys to each uh, each pass it along. And then after they all speak, then we'll go around and you know maybe look for a few audience members who want to participate, throw some ideas about there on the on the topic, um, and we'll kind of go through that. So I'm not going to elaborate much further than what James has just done, except to tell you that the rationale behind keeping it in that tiered structure was to avoid the possibility of big pharma or monopolization by any one entity. Uh, the craft beer situation in Vermont was one of our models. We would prefer to keep it at that level. And as you go through this process and wonder why is it set up this way, the basic premise behind that is we're trying to keep control over it and not let it control us which unfortunately has happened in other states. Part of our work in the legislature was to go around to other states and check out what they did right, what they did wrong. Hopefully, the system we've got set up, and poor James is gonna be uh, suffering through for the next few months trying to figure out how to make it work right, is going to be something that is unique to Vermont, and we keep it small enough so that all of you have an opportunity to participate and nobody gets squeezed out. Thank you, <clears throat> I'm going to take a slightly different bent on this. Um, I'm not directly involved in policy uh, at all. Uh, I'm not involved, I'm not on the board, I'm not on the advisory board. Um, so I'm kind of in the difficult position of advising our clients uh, on how to comply with regulations that haven't been crafted yet. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just kind of go over with everybody a little bit of what we're talking about with our clients, some of the advice we're giving that we hope uh, is going to help them position themselves to be uh, in compliance once the regulations do come out. So a couple of the considerations of cultivation we have, um, you know, from a boots on the ground perspective, we love the craft cultivation license. We think it's a fantastic idea, uh, a low cost way for every Vermonter to be able to participate in this market. Uh, one of the commonalities we see in all adult use jurisdictions is for the first year, we see demand seriously outpace supply. 
Um, until that equilibrium is reached, until we find out what the market is going to be, there is generally lines around the block, dispensaries are limited in what they can sell, and by having this craft cultivation program, we can do what Vermont does best, and that is create a craft farm joint product. Um, and so we're so excited about that. But we have our clients come in and say, okay, well, what, uh, what do we do? How do we start this? You know, we're about eight months away from the timeline for applications due, which is going to be April of 2022 for craft cultivation licenses. So some of the things we're trying to look at now in anticipation of the regulations are, how is this going to impact those around you? Are you going to try to cultivate in the backyard in a residential neighborhood in Essex? That might not be such a great idea. Uh, are you trying to cultivate on your 40 uh, acre farm in the kingdom, for example? Well, that's gonna probably be a lot uh, better of an idea. So we try to counsel our clients into looking at how is this going to impact those around you? Are there going to be people who are gonna complain? Is the town you're in going to be supportive of this? Trying to create those relationships where talking to a select board or a town manager and finding out if your town supports this. Finding a location that the smell perhaps is not going to impact uh, any neighboring businesses or neighboring uh, neighbors for that matter. You know, we wanna to try to avoid any speed bumps, any headaches, uh, down the road by preemptively addressing those issues now. Security is another major issue. We saw a lot of hemp theft. Uh, and you can only imagine when we have adult use going up what that's gonna look like. So how do we work now before we have security regulations? Anonymity, maybe not putting your grow right on uh, a major road where it can be seen. Uh, anonymity is the best security. So having something in your back uh, acres where it's not visible from a road, or it's not visible from any uh, passerby, that might be a good idea. Um, environmental impact. This is a huge issue nationwide uh, with cannabis growth. So how, you know, we start talking to our clients about how are you going to demonstrate environmental stewardship? How are you going to offset the impact of the electricity you might be using in an indoor grow or the water in a hydroponic setup? Do you have solar panels? Are you using a water reclamation system? These are the type of concepts and thoughts that we feel are going to make a strong application when the time comes. Um, social equity. Another hugely important topic, uh, one we could probably spend the entire panel discussing. But how are you, as an licensed applicant, going to demonstrate a commitment towards social equity? Is it through you yourself uh, have been disproportionately impacted? Is it through a hiring plan that's going to include maybe those who have been incarcerated for cannabis offenses? Is it through maybe a donation to a fund that means something? We have a client that's currently setting up a fund to support indigenous populations. We think that's an amazing idea. You know, and it's not about grabbing a token BIPOC person and putting them on your board. No, that's not what this is about. This is about something that means something to you, to give back to the community, to give back to those who have been victimized by a absolutely pointless and atrocious war on drugs for the last 40 years. Um, ownership of the land. This is a little more of a practical issue, but for those of you who may not be aware, commercial cannabis operations, if occurring on a land that a bank or financial institution holds a security interest in, that could be a real problem. Banks are federally regulated. They really don't like the idea of federally illegal activity going on with a property that they have a financial uh, security interest in. So how can we keep this accessible to those who can't necessarily afford to buy their own land? Are we gonna be able to have several growers on one piece of land, let's say, Farmer A has a 100 acre uh, land that's been in his family, they own without a mortgage. Are they gonna be able to lease out individual plots? Uh, what are we gonna do about biomass for edibles? For everybody who's familiar with the hemp industry, hemp and CBD, that's federally legal, that can cross state lines. High THC cannot. We have an anticipated 200 to $250 million mature market here in Vermont, of which an anticipated 30 to 35% are gonna be edibles. When you do the math, that's close to 50 to $60 million worth of edibles and concentrates and consumable products that need to be manufactured here in Vermont. How are we gonna do that with 1,000 square foot craft indoor grows? We're gonna need out them. So we're starting to talk to people about you know, what we think the regulations may look like. We look at neighboring states, we look at the current regulations for Vermont medical program, and we're trying to work with people. So if you guys have any questions about this, um, as the regulations come down from the board, we're gonna be getting those out to everybody. Uh, but until then, if you do have questions about some of the steps that can be taken now prior to regulation, we do feel we at least can kind of guide people in the right direction. We hope we're not too far off. So thank you very much. All right. Um, so of course, I always like to look at this kind of from the medical angle, right? And as I mentioned before, I look at all consumers as 
not necessarily patients, but at least deserving medical quality, clean cannabis. So as Tim mentioned, it's a really important to think about where we're gonna grow. So one of the questions I would wanna address is, are we growing in moldy basements or what are the parameters to ensure where these grows are happening to make sure this is clean cannabis? And regardless of where they're growing, we have to get into the, test, the question about lab testing. Lab testing is the only way to ensure consumer safety. Again, whether that's a patient in the medical dispensary or that's a consumer because we don't know what that consumer is using for. Do they have any medical underlying conditions that we need to protect? So really when I look at it, I'm looking at that protection lens. So we have lab testing is most important. Um, and then something that I actually just thought of as, as Mr. Pepper, you were speaking, is that thousand square foot craft license, that would be a fantastic caregiver license. Give that license to one, one person that can cultivate and see how many patients they can help and support with that thousand square feet. As a caregiver who's been doing it for years, limited to a very small plant count, if I was given a thousand foot square foot license to be able to help, I know I could help four, six, maybe eight patients instead of my one patient. So just as we're talking about these craft tier um, licenses, thinking about how caregiving cultivation fits into that and how we can kind of differentiate that. And just as anyone in the audience for you guys to know, something that we are working towards and advocating for is for all medical patient card holders to hopefully be able to shop at any adult use dispensary without paying those extra taxes. So that then would give you guys 6,000 registered, con you know, regular consuming patients access to your market, to your little dispensary, to your, um, what I would love to also see is that a direct farm to table. So can these small cultivators somehow, and I think that's a long shot, honestly, but somehow be a little more involved in the retail so they're not necessarily losing that money to that middleman because, you know, as, as I've been a cultivator for a long time trying to grow for someone, I know how expensive that can be. Um, so if we can help that at all, that would, you know, be another thought as we talk about craft licenses. So just throwing in the message. It's kind of so open-ended about all the things that need to be figured out. But a couple of the questions that are on the survey and, and, and sort of prompts and sort of, I guess, where it's a good opportunity to start getting people's ideas, sort of about um, the idea of, of supply, uh, in part thinking about what does a thousand square foot license produce annually? You know, this is one of the questions that's on the survey and or sort of what are sort of the equivalents outside, um, you know, and talking about a space like this, which is a mixed light space, um, right? You know, or even kind of how that's defined with cultivation. Um, I will, if people want to like put their hands up and, and ask questions or, you know, contribute, I'll, I'll sort of work my way around. Otherwise I have plenty of questions for the panel myself. Well, but I'm a farmer in Brownington. I'm originally from San Francisco, California, where we've had uh, legal cannabis sales for 30 years. Uh, from my youth to this moment on, I've uh, been a, um, a consumer of cannabis, a cultivator of cannabis. Uh, I actually happened to supply the original cannabis uh, dispensary in San Francisco uh, as a uh, underage um, cannabis uh, worker. <laughs> um, so now here I'm in uh, the kingdom and I see this happening and um, I have a lot to say, but I want to get right to the heart of this. So we're talking about craft, craft, right? What does this actually mean? Right? From a connoisseur's perspective, it means what you see in the package, what you smell in the package, um, what you experience when you're consuming the product. One thing that I'm really concerned about uh, after going on vacation in Massachusetts, uh, Cape Cod, I, I visited a dispensary there and uh, bought some cannabis just, you know, out of curiosity to see how they do it there. And um, so this is what they've got. It's a vertically integrated uh, operation. Uh, they grow their own cannabis. They sell their own cannabis. Everything is in this label. It's very generic. Uh, I can't see it. I can't smell it. What I have here though is the name of the product. It's, uh, it's a uh, Goblin Punch. Sorry, my eyes are getting old. Um, and uh, the next thing down the line is THC content. Well, if that's all I have to shop with, I'm going to go with the highest THC content available because I don't want to get stoned. There's nothing, there's nothing connoisseur about this at all. There's nothing craft about this at all, right? We, 
First of all, why is it in a childproof container? This material in here is completely safe, right? Like it is not gonna get an animal or a young child high if they eat it. It needs to be, excuse me, I'm not a, a chemist here, but it needs to be decarbonized. Am I saying it right? Right? It needs to be cooked. It needs to be saturated in alcohol. It needs to be burned for the effect to take place. Right? In its natural plant form, as a flower, it has no psychedelic effect to the user whatsoever. I don't think this works anymore. Um, so what I'm saying is, if we want to actually promote the craft business, that's our only opportunity here in the kingdom, right? Because we are up against big business. I know you're trying to keep them out, but they're already in. They're here already, right? They're here from Canada, they're here from Russia, they're buying up the dispensaries. We are fighting against them as small business people in the kingdom. How are we gonna do it? We need to have a real law that represents the craft. The craft are the terpenes. The craft is the look of it. When I open this up, it's all gone. <laughs> uh, when I opened this up, what I saw was a mediocre machine uh, manicured product. You know, it might as well be McDonald's. And that's what we're going to be getting all over the place if we don't have an opportunity to allow consumers to come in, handle, smell, look at, understand. Because, you know, this isn't about THC necessarily. I mean, THC is an amazing medicine, an amazing uh, recreational product. But it's also about the terpenes, it's about the profile, it's about the smell, it's like wine. This is two buck chuck, Merlot. If anybody knows anything about wine, you know, means nothing to me. I personally like Gamay from uh, Beaujolais. This is not Beaujolais, you know. So what I'm imploring you all is please give us an opportunity to display our product, to share our product, uh, in a visual and olfactory nature and not make it in a childproof container that's plastic, that'll end up in the garbage in the landfill. I think Coven, uh, Coventry is uh, where these will all end up. Uh, so here's another product. There's a vape pen in here. Uh, same packaging, very generic. Um, they direct you online to look at what's actually in here. Uh, so this is just... Uh, uh, a flavorless THC product that they added a bunch of natural flavoring to. They called it Blue Dream. It's not Blue Dream. It's, it, it, it's just a generic THC product with a bunch of flavors in here. So, like, you know, is that what we're going to do? You know, we're not doing this. We can't do this. This is just going to be cheap. Nobody's going to come to Vermont for this because they have this in their own backyard. We need high quality, right? Like, real high quality, and I need to make sure that this law represents this. I think I'm done. Right. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate everybody. I want to encourage everybody to everybody participate. If we do the clapping, it'll become a whole thing for clapping more for some people and not others. So in the interest of moving the discussion, letting everybody have their say, I'll just ask that we hold off. Because I know in part with packaging, there are things that are in the provisions already in the law uh, and things that are other topics of discussion. Um, and I know that, you know, Kevin and Senator Benning, you know, Tim, I know that we've talked about this a lot. Um, and I know you guys talked about this a lot. Um, but a good opportunity, I guess, pack packaging is a big thing, I think, to take out of what, what you were saying, David. I appreciate you sharing. Um, so uh, I'll just use this as a talking so, stick for now. I was going to say, don't, don't even bother looking silly as we go. That ain't worth it. You say you're from San Francisco. Yeah. Uh, have you ever been to Alaska's dispensaries? Anyone? No, I've been to Alaska. Okay. Well, if you go to Talkeetna, Alaska, it's a fairly high-end town. You would walk into the store. Every, I'll call them baristas, I don't even know what we would call them here. But everyone is trained to know what the product is. The product is displayed in a way that you can actually smell it, get an understanding from each barista as how it would affect you if you consume it. And to me, that's exactly where we need to be. Yeah. It's not any different from walking into a Vermont beer craft store and getting a taste <laughs> of each one of the things that are offered and making up your mind about how it will affect you.
what it is you want to actually purchase. The beauty of that is twofold. You get educated, but you also know that what you're buying has run through the Vermont <coughs> laboratory system to make sure what you're buying is safe. That's part of the selling point for those of us that are trying to sell this in the legislature. Very important points. I've been to dispensaries now in Colorado, Alaska, Massachusetts, and the medical dispensaries here in Vermont. And I agree completely with what you're saying. Getting from here to there is not like flipping on a light switch. This poor sucker has to develop all of the rules that are associated with what you have just described. Those rules are actually proposals which have to run through the legislative process and meet with at least one committee of very uh, important note, the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. They have to review each one of those rules with a fine tooth comb and decide whether it meets with legislative intent. But those of us who are on that committee and have spent the past 10 years trying to figure out exactly where we want to go, we understand completely what you're saying. The last thing in the world I want to hear is that Big Pharma is already here because we are doing everything we can to keep that from happening. And in our conversations around the state, our conversations ran the gamut, but there's a nice little guy down in Putney named Stewart. He could not understand why it was that he couldn't grow as he normally does and sell it at his farm stand on the roadside. Well, I, I hate to disappoint you, but no, we can't get that far in the legislature. That's just not gonna happen. But arriving at a craft experience where you can go through the motions of what you've just described is exactly where we want to go. Yeah. Uh, I just got back from Oregon. <coughs> I think they had a great method there. I really touch it, but you can see it, you can smell it. And then they weigh out what you want. And then they have uh, the child food containers there that they then put it in. A label's printed out, they wrap it around. Uh, we're currently, from my kind of solutions, are working with a packaging company out of Colorado that has child food packaging, but it's biodegradable hemp plastics, um, something in that neighborhood. Now, right now, those are expensive, so we're trying to balance out where the cost to the retailer is going to be versus the environmental sustainability. But there are models in which we can incorporate that. Um, you know, and I do think that with a little bit of creativity, we can make that work. Um, I would love to see something similar to that. I think the packaging issues in cannabis uh, are huge. I'm coming out from Las Vegas dispensary. You have your <laughs> product in another box, in another ring, in another bag. That means you want an exit bag to come out and you, know, you end up with more weight and trash than you do in actual cannabis. I think that's an example of over-regulation. It's a little ridiculous. And I think, thankfully, we have an opportunity here in Vermont to kind of learn from that and see, all right, is this really necessary? Or can we take a hybrid model, something like the Oregon, where that craft cannabis can be displayed, but yet can assure the concerns of the prohibitionists? So let's face it, in a state where we've done this legislatively, there are always going to be two sides. Both sides may not have equally valid points. In fact, some sides may have not valid points at all, but that doesn't change the fact that they have a seat at the table and that we need to be able to do this through a uh, compromise. So while I don't believe we're ever going to get them to agree to no child proof, uh, no child proofing, I do think that with a little creativity, we can take something like an Oregon model where we get that opportunity to see that craft quality while still uh, making sure that the concerns of the prohibitionists are dealt with through some sort of biodegradable child proof package. I have some of those creative ideas. The longest <laughs> running third party certifying program in the country for clean cannabis with a premise of environmental stewardship and Consumer protection. One, ooh, it works. There you go. Um, one of the things Clean Green does is have a carbon reduction program. So every year, to get your Clean Green certification, you have to prove you're doing a, a step every year to reduce that carbon footprint. So part of that is packaging. You cannot use completely unconscious packaging. So I talk about conscious cannabis a lot, right? So that means we have to find a middle ground. What is childproof? But what? is biodegradable and an idea i've thought of that clean green's working on now is having farmers work together so maybe the whole state of vermont has mandated statewide packaging that we buy at a bulk rate for biodegradable childproof packaging that we all use with our own label just like when you go to the pharmacy it's the same bottle that you use but it's as environmentally conscious as possible the other thought clean green is working on and i would love to see and i know stephanie is here listening if we had 
you know, a lot of farmers use EM1. A lot of farmers use um, ProGrow. If we had large, um, large packaging or facilities we can grow and go to and use our refillable, reusable bottle, the amount of plastic containers that are used to feed cannabis plants and to supplement everything we need to do is not environmentally friendly. So how can we bring some of this environmental stewardship into the program right from the bat? And maybe that is having standardized packaging. Maybe that is having bulk fill-up stations like you do at the co-op for your rice and beans instead of everybody throwing away a quarter gallon or a gallon bottle five times a month. So I think there are ways to do this. It's just finding those creative ways. And we have that unique ability, like Eli said, to do this beforehand. So let's look at this you know, environmental impact and how we can start at the lowest carbon you know, footprint before we even get started. Solutions that are out there right now, right? I mean, we know on the on the on the legacy market, there's a ton of mylar out there. Um, there are also people doing cool things with compostable, renewable, other kinds of packaging and boxes and all that. So, um, again, opportunities to to share and get involved in the process. Um, I, I guess moving on from cultivation, one of the big topics is is testing and, and tracking. And again, where there are some there are some realities, um, and then there's a lot of discretion and talking about sort of what is required for, uh, for medical products, what's required for consumer products as far as what information is, is displayed. Um, and I think testing and tracking are kind of two different topics that are both very important. So maybe we can just start with, with testing um, and sort of catch us up on what's required presently in the current legislation and sort of what are the considerations um, and sort of what should folks be, be thinking about or where can they have, you know, where can their input matter as far as their experience with testing? Um, as anybody in this room, this is one of the questions on the survey, anybody here ever paid to have their cannabis tested before? Okay, so that's, that's pretty important. Um, one of the questions on the survey is how much you would expect to pay over the course of a year. And I think that's eventually the kind of numbers that we need to get and hopefully give to our, our regulators and our representatives to try to inform this with some actual real industry experience. So just talking about testing, consumer safety, costs, sort of parameters, regulations, uh, what are the considerations right now and, and what are we thinking about moving yeah, forward? Yeah, so uh, I mentioned uh, earlier that the original motivation behind um, regulating cannabis was a consumer protection angle. I think you know we've added a lot of um, additional considerations along the way. Um, social equity, environmental stewardship, et cetera. But the original thought was, if so many folks are using this um, on a you know monthly basis, you know what other product is out there that isn't tested, that isn't you know have some minimum safety standards? So to me, this is one of those issues uh, that is central to our mission as uh, the Cannabis Control Board. That being said, um, we have been given the authority to make accommodations for small cultivators. So when it comes to testing, uh, it really you know comes down to how much testing and what is tested for, and what 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 can we ensure that we have a safe product? What are the creative ways that we can go about making sure that Vermonters are consuming and our tourists are consuming a safe product? And I think that um, some of what we've heard is uh, comes from Jesse Lynn and thinking about these third-party certifications and having uh, cooperative style grow operations where people are looking out for each other and um, we're having kind of uh, standards that are voluntarily imposed um, and having um, ways that we can really ensure that testing itself, the cost of testing, isn't an absolute barrier to entry for small cultivators. Um, but uh, again, you know, we have some good examples. We have people at uh, Intervale, the UVM extension that have talked to us about testing, the CAPS program that have talked to us about maybe creating standards that people can can um, can uh, can follow, and then uh, we can kind of do sample testing. But it's something we really haven't had a chance to really dig in. I know that every um, state has various levels of testing standards. We've spoken to the certified labs here. Um, we've spoken extensively with our um, cannabis quality program at the Agency of Ag, the two, two folks that run that, on how they do hemp testing. I know that that's dictated a lot by what the USDA standards are. Um, but I think that we are going to have a path forward um, that will allow a safe product but will not be prohibitive to the folks that are growing currently. Why would the testing for uh 
THC cannabis differing uh, with from uh, the testing that we currently do on industrial hemp for CBD and other cannabinoids. We do full panel testing, uh, we do cannabinoid testing, we do, you know, for my, uh, mold and pesticides and things of that nature. What's the difference between THC testing and industrial hemp testing? They're both cannabis. Yeah, no difference and what's at all. The, what's the dilemma? Well, and I think we have also some other, other folks here with hemp testing experience. I won't put everybody on the spot here, but uh, do you want to ask other people with hemp testing experience sort of what works well about that system and, and what doesn't? Because what people do individually and what they do, you know, what they do voluntarily, what they do by mandate, I think different questions. And right now, uh, I think the analytical lab license is one that's also sort of in flux as far as who's going to be doing this testing and how much of that capacity is out there, right? So right now, everybody can get their hemp tested sort of through whatever group, but with THC, that's not going to be the case. So I will say that'll probably be one significant difference, at least on paper, but I do want to get other people, I know we have a lot of hemp folks in here, input on the on the testing, what works well, what doesn't. $500 a year for testing? We got a couple, well, well more than that, a lot of folks say. So um, I, I do want to kick it back here to the panel because I know there are also other things in legislation about the testing requirements, uh, and that is its own whole license. So uh, I want to give you folks a chance to maybe respond to some of that or just say how to, you know, what the testing looks like in the future or what you'd like it to look like. I have a step and say the reason that we are using testing as one of the measuring devices of this being successful, is you have 180 lawmakers that you have to sell on this entire experiment. And if you don't give them the impression that you are trying to be as safe as possible, the experiment collapses because you cannot, despite the feelings of everybody in this room, you cannot get legislation by 180 lawmakers. To answer the question about what it looks like in the future, I think we are taking our cue now from James and his team, um, listening to continued feedback like we're having here to decide what works and what doesn't. We are cognizant of the fact that we cannot have something so expensive at the taxing, taxing level that your product then becomes more expensive and it cannot compete with a underground market that we are trying to defeat at the same time. And I realize that's a sweeping statement. I realize that the underground market is always going to be there, but selling this experiment to the legislature requires us to come up with a game plan. So while testing may be inconvenient, uh, testing may be different from place to place, the bottom line is we have to be unified in the concept that we are trying to produce a safe product for sale and yet do it at an expense that doesn't interfere uh, with everything else we're trying to do here, including have a battle with the black market. So I, I'm listening, we are cognizant that there are differences of opinion, uh, but right now there are no solid legislative pieces that I'm aware of that are gonna dictate this process. I think we're taking our cues from James and company. Thank you for testing, it's gonna be standardization. Uh, organizations like the NACB right now are working on a uniform set of standards that can be applied in all jurisdictions. Uh, I think any of us know anything about our medical program up to this point, one of the many issues plaguing that program was the fact of self-testing and no third-party testing. Uh, you know, this is something that needs to be done for consumer protection. Uh, the big issues with the vitamin E acetate a few years back, uh, that would have been caught by testing. Uh, cannabis itself is a bioaccumulator, which means that wherever it's planted, if it's outside, it will suck up anything in the soil. It's used to remediate uh, nuclear waste sites. So there is a chance of heavy metal contamination. There is a chance of pesticide contamination. These are the type of things that we need to be able to figure out. We need to be able to sell a safe product. 
Uh, people do not go blind from alcohol. They do not die from uh, you know bootleg alcohol anymore because we know when we walk into a store and buy a bottle of 80 proof vodka, that's 40%. It's gonna be the same in Arizona as it is in New York. There's no question because we have standardization. Standardization is what we are trying to reach with testing. The consumer protection aspect of this law is why we've gotten a lot of people in the legislature who are not necessarily supportive of cannabis on board with this, and we are able to move forward with a legislatively enacted law. Um, and as far as seed to sale tracking, I do want to remind everybody, one of the reasons the federal government does not crack down on state legal marijuana is due to several points in what's known as the coal memo. And I'm not gonna bore everybody with a recitation of what it's all about. One of the major components of the Cole Memo is a program to prevent diversion. And that means something to prevent state legal marijuana from crossing state lines illegally and going into a non-legal state, for example, New Hampshire. So while I'm not a huge fan of seed to sale tracking, and I think it's a little absurd, the reason we have it is to make sure we are in compliance with those federal guidelines that are sure we're not gonna see federal law enforcement come down on Vermont's program. And this is unfortunately some of the realities of the fact that this still remains. Marijuana, cannabis is a controlled one, uh, schedule one controlled substance that contains greater than 0.3% THC. And that reality means that we do have to accept some things we don't like. And this is one of the major problems with farm stand. I love the idea, it is so Vermont, it is perfect. When it comes down to it, this is not a dangerous substance. However, if that was to happen, Federal authorities would view that as a violation of the Cole Memorandum, the Cole uh, Memo against diversion. There would be no safeguards in place. And that could end up seeing federal law enforcement coming down like the bad old days. David, I'm sure you remember 2013, 2014 in California when the crackdowns happened. This is something that we need to avoid in a burgeoning market like Vermont. We have a great opportunity here, uh, but people do need to realize what we want and the reality of what we have to do, at least in the beginning, may not always be in line. But remember, these rules are not set in stone. We're gonna have regulations coming down from the board, and we're gonna have to jump through the hoops and follow them. But I guarantee you, two, three, four years down the road, as our market matures, as the fears of the prohibitionists simply do not come to be, we will see those regulations change. And uh, I just want everyone to be you know, confident that we are going to get to where we need to be. It may not be immediately, but we will get to where we want to be, I believe that. Testing. So I'm going to circle back to the original question. CBD and hemp testing, no different than any kind of cannabis THC testing, right? The hemp program has done a really good job of putting parameters in place to test hemp. And we're looking at testing different things at different times, right? We want to test that whole panel, so all the tests for contaminants for the flower. But we don't have to test the flower for residuals. We have to test our concentrate for residuals. So the hemp program has really defined how we can do the mandated testing to ensure consumer safety at the most affordable, in the most affordable way. I think the big difference is that indoor is going to be cycling more often, right? We're going to be harvesting hopefully every eight weeks or so, not once a year. So that's where we're going to see the testing need to be more often. So that's where the concern for finances is going to come in. So I hope to see either a statewide, you know, laboratory that is affordable for everybody or independent laboratories that, as Jen mentioned before, we create relationships with. So they make it affordable because you're going there every month or you're going there every six weeks or every harvest. But again, then there's parameters. I was speaking with a young gentleman um, this afternoon as we were driving up here talking about this. So not every harvest do you need to test for heavy metals if you're using the same indoor soil, right? But every harvest you have to test for mildew and mold. Not every harvest do you need to test for pesticides. But well, I would hope this, the state's checking you every three or four harvests, right? So we have to find parameters to ensure that consumer safety, but still make it affordable and make that testing affordable. And I really truly think everybody, every grower, every hemp farmer I've talked to, they want the testing. They're not refusing the testing. They want to produce and show proof that they are doing clean, safe cannabis as best they can, but they can't afford it. That's the reason people aren't doing the testing. So really it's about making it affordable and making a program that ensures it, but at what level? Because not every single harvest needs to be tested inside and out, but we absolutely need to be doing spot checks and then how do we do that to make that work? So I think, you know, 
the state is looking towards the hemp program as a really good example. And anyone, the hemp farmers here, and anyone who doesn't know the hemp statute, take a look at those, because I have a feeling that's a lot of what the state is going to be doing because the Agency of Agriculture has done a really good job putting that into place so far. Uh, my name is Cam Devereaux from my family and myself all in Northeast Kingdom Hemp. Uh, we have a processing facility and we bought an HPLC for testing, so I got a little bit of insight what we're doing. Um, that's been a big question. There's several, there's 12 different machines out there. They all test a little bit different. There's not one that has a, a standard that tells you it is the best. Oh, so they haven't been, you know, there's not one out there that says it is better than the other. We've been working with Ember Scientific. They've come up with a uh, a thing where you, you buy a sample from them and they mail it to 10 or 12 different facilities and they all bring it back in and find a general standard so that you all follow in. If you hit their standards, they'll give you a badge. So far, this is our third, second year. We've been able to test for bud and for um, extractions so that we know that we're accurate. So that's just been kind of something we've been trying to find somebody that can tell you, you know, that you're somewhere in the round. So there is people out there that are working on testing and stuff to help with that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Chris Colby, and I'm a consultant with, with uh, three different folks that are looking to open uh, dispensaries in the uh, Vermont area. Uh, I do want to take a step back on cultivation because I think we kind of, I, don't, I grew up in Burlington really to hear what people have to say about cultivation. I think we kind of jumped off it a little bit quick because all I really heard about was small craft cultivation. But I'm more concerned, and you know, one way or the other, about large-scale cultivation. Um, when there was a meeting down in Bristol, there was a couple who moved here from California. I don't know who they were, but they got up and they said, "Look, in California, we had a 55-acre farm. We grew 88,000 plants. And if you do some simple math, even if it's if you have a pound of weed per plant, okay, even if it was 80,000." Plants are 55 acre plant. You know, we're talking 40 tons of weed for one person. 40 tons, okay? So if there are people who have huge farmland in Vermont, there's people who are growing massive amounts of hemp in other parts of the area. They can look at it and say, hey, let's go to Vermont. We can grow some great product outdoor there, you know, on acres and acres and acres of land. So, I mean, if you look at Oregon, what happened there, there were people. So everyone jumped in the game, and there was such an oversupply. I mean, pounds were selling for three hundred dollars a year, and that's definitely what we don't want in Vermont. So I'm not a cultivation expert, but I think that's something that needs to be talked about almost as much as, you know, hey, we want all these you know small cultivators to come in here because that is super important. But the bigger thing, from a protectionist standpoint, for all the small scale cultivators you're not going to be able to compete when you've got people growing 50 acres of, of cannabis. And so what is the, what are the, you know, the rules and regs that you guys are going to design? And I'm really not a big one on telling people heavily regulated, you can do this, you can't do that. But on this large scale cultivation, somehow that needs to be talked about and addressed. The idea of a, uh, something that's being, that's being talked about and sort of, do we know anything about sizing of tiers? Yet, I know it's pretty early in that. We're working with our consultants to do this kind of demand analysis for Vermont and our tourists that come here annually. Um, and we're gonna try to estimate the size and the need of Vermont's cultivation and uh, kind of reverse engineer a, cult a tiering structure, knowing that we're gonna try to, you know, move as much of the legacy market into the regulated space at the outset. Um, we have a big uh, report due to the legislature on October 1st, which lays out the market contours um, that needs legislative approval. And I think that in that report, it's an opportunity for the board to take uh, the next step, which is um, to kind of explain why we might need certain tiers, certain levels, why we might need a cap on production for some of the um, higher level uh, cultivators, the, the larger cultivators, why we might need um, certain aspects to ensure that we don't have, um, you know, an oversupply of kind of the generic, you know, McWeed or whatever, um, Starbuds. Yeah. But, um, but uh, you know, I think that's an important, uh, that's an important piece of legislation. One thing that um, I wanted to touch on as well is that, that while there's a number, any number of compromises that have been made 
in the legislation um, that enables uh, the Cannabis Board to act. Um, there is a, a very one important piece uh, that hasn't been touched on yet, is that any one company, any one person, um, is only allowed to own one of each type of licensing. So there's gonna be no franchising in this industry. Um, there's gonna be, if you're, uh, if you're a large cultivator, you only get one retail shop. Um, uh, so, you know, I think it's important to touch on that the legislature, while they made any number of compromises, they all had in their minds that this needs to be done on a Vermont scale and it needs to benefit Vermonters. Um, so I'll leave it there. I guess my question for you, Chris, would be, um, you know, we already have the dispensaries here, who I think you're a part of one of the dispensaries, I could be wrong. Um, okay, you were, okay, thank you. So I guess my question for you then would be, you know, if you had a connection with them, are we worried about that competing with the medical dispensaries? And then that brings me back to the question of, we should be having the conversation as to why the medical dispensaries are the only ones allowed to have that integrated license because we know how that can be so much more beneficial than having those individual licenses. So I just wanted to kind of tie that into it to mention that the medical dispensaries do have that integrated license ability, which does put that small cultivator at an unfortunate disadvantage when starting. So, and I wanted to mention too that um, Stephanie and the hemp program actually do have the labeling requirements already discussed where it does have to be, you know, they have the parameters where you can say it's a Vermont product. So they've done a really good job with that. All right, the, um, and I do want to throw out there, a lot of these things are, you know, are, are in stone via the, uh, the legislation that's taken a long time to happen, and that doesn't mean that's how it's going to look forever. So I know beyond consumption, there are questions about delivery and other types of licenses, um, and so I'll open it up to the panel because I know I'm interested in cannabis events, obviously, um, consumption lounges, things like this. I'm curious what other types of licenses have been discussed, have been imagined, have worked well in other states, um, or maybe that we're not thinking about yet here in Vermont, whether it's something like a lodging hotelier license, um, you know, butt and brunch, that type of thing, or events sort of. Uh, what are these other type of licenses and maybe delivery mechanisms, just in case we have a ton of licensed small growers in the fall uh, and not a ton of outlets? Um, so how are we going to distribute this maybe in the, you know, in the future and, and what some of those other licenses maybe look like uh, long off in the future? So uh, the one kind of typical legislative mechanism for controversial issues, especially when the kind of legislative clock starts winding down, um, is to, group, to kick ideas that are controversial to other people and have them report back. Um, that happens with a number of issues, um, good ideas uh, that uh, were brought to the table through the kind of long path that Act 164 took. Um, these include, um, well, there's a number of prohibited products that we're required to report back to the legislature on whether they should continue to be prohibited. These include concentrates, um, these include uh, THC limits. Right now, THC um, is capped at 30%. Um, these include special event licenses, on-site consumption, delivery, curbside uh, sales. Um, a lot of the issues that kind of have a built-in advocacy either for or against um, that didn't make it across the finish line, but I think will contribute to the vibrancy of Vermont's market. Um, I think that when you think about people needing flour, you know, we pass, we allow for home grow. We, you know, you're allowed to grow six plants. Um, you know, I don't know anyone uh, in Vermont that's kind of doesn't know where to find um, flour. Uh, so really, if we're thinking about, you know, who are, who is, what does the market look like in, you know, two years, five years? And I think it's largely going to be dependent upon Vermont's hospitality industry, um, Vermont's tourism industry, um, these specialized products that are currently prohibited. And unfortunately, these are kind of legislative issues that need to be worked out. So I will pass the microphone to the legislator on the committee. Gee, thanks, James. Um, let me say that every one of us is a human being, and when we react to a given proposal, we all have differences of opinion on how things should work. The legislature is no different. With this particular subject, we have come 
eons away from where we were, in my case, in 1975. And it is frustrating to some about how slow the process works, but the process does work eventually. Building upon success stories is the way you're going to get literally event licenses, any kind of roadside dispensary system. You have to build from success, not just throw it out there and say, we can do this, you should trust us. Because if you take that approach, it's going nowhere. And we have fought for years as a result of trying it that way. One of the things that got us to where we are today was Vermont's medical dispensary system. It was demonstrated that the world would not collapse if we established a medical system. And we are now embarking on a tax and regulated system, which is limited, admittedly, in scope. But the success of that will depend upon whether we reach the next step. James is perfectly right. When we get into controversial issues that we can't resolve in a flash, we usually kick it to a study committee of some kind. Well, you guys are all now part of that study committee. Are we going to be successful in what has been granted for permission right now? If we are, then the legislature will take another look at it. Another part of this is the federal delegation, keeping pressure on the federal delegation to get rid of this substance from the, the um, Schedule One narcotic label and have it treated completely different at the federal level would give the state the ability to have much more flexibility. So I know a lot of you are impatient, but you have to recognize success where success is and you have to be able to work to continue that success in order to reach the next step. I hope that answers your question. I know it's not satisfactory, but I hope it answers your question. All right, so this is the age-old question nurses get all the time. It's consumption, how does it work, how, what do I take? So in my mind, it's really all about education, right? We want to come from a prevention standpoint, but we want to come from a harm reduction standpoint too. So it sounds silly, but one of the harm reduction things I talk to people about is, oh, you're not gonna reduce your cannabis use? Can you clean your pipe and not smoke out of something that's really dirty? So that's the same thing with edibles. It's the same thing with topicals. It's the same thing with sublinguals. How does it work? And if I have the education, it's gonna be safer. So instead of having THC caps, Maybe that 32% THC flower comes with a different label or a warning. Instead of having only five milligram edibles, maybe it comes with a little card that explains how long it takes for that edible to work to help mitigate the side effects that you might not want or to have you understand how much to actually use. So in my mind, it's really all about education. I don't wanna see any THC caps because I talk to way too many veterans who are going to be um, using the adult use market because they don't want to put their name on a medical card. I was a nurse that took my doctor convincing me to put my name to get a medical card because I didn't want my name in the system. Those are the people that were going to be shopping at the adult use markets. They deserve to have no THC caps on their flower just like the medical patients. No 60% only concentrates so that means they can't have any smokable concentrates. That means they can't have FICO or that really strong medicine people use for cancer or for chronic pain. So I, you know, something I keep speaking to over and over is we need an education program. We need our bud tenders to have this education so when they're selling edibles to somebody or when someone walks in and says, oh yeah, I'm gonna try to stop taking my opioids and Xanax, they know to say, oh, you might wanna talk to a medical provider about that, right? So we need that education more than we need that prohibition nicest, some of the highest quality cannabis I've ever seen in my life. Um, I really think that that craft grow, regardless of what some large cultivation may do, they're never going to be able to reach that quality. And when people are coming to Vermont, they want the Cabot Cheddar, they want the Ben and Jerry's, they want the Hill Farmstead and the Heady Topper, they want that craft quality. And uh, I don't think people are going to be interested, and I don't think there's going to be a market for uh, mass-produced well, I think there's a I think there's a question to it. Another another topic, sort of about product definition as well, right? I mean, in thinking maybe about lessons from CBD, um, about in part what happens when an industry goes national and federal prohibition does end, 
right? Is something a Vermont product? Let's say you have an edible product. Is it a Vermont product if the distillate comes from Colorado? Or it comes from Maine? You know, I mean, the chocolate probably didn't come from Vermont, but right? You know, so thinking, imagining those types of things in definitions, those are some practical things about defining what products are, where maybe, you know, we can sort of preserve that brand that we're talking about, where anybody can't come into Vermont, drop a ton of money on marketing and land, and all of a sudden they are the Vermont product, right? Because marketing can do a lot of that work. Um, I do want to. I, I want to. I want to let folks, you know, chime in. We'll sort of do a uh, a last thing real quick, and I, I, I do want to mention consumption real quick because I know a lot of you in this room are thinking about it. Um, but also, just kidding, guys. Um, but also, uh, I do want to bring that up because we are here at Burke to talk about sort of tourism and licensing, and I know we have people who have experience in other regulated industries who are here as well. Um, so uh, I, I did want to get onto the question of sort of consumption and what legal consumption by 21 year old plus adults look like in the future. So I'll, I'll start with Jesse Lady and I promised our panel who have uh, been absolutely amazing and, and generous with their time. I really want to encourage folks again. Um, I want to take maybe a couple more, a uh, couple more, you know, sort of comments here for folks, maybe things that we haven't thought about that haven't come up yet. And then really again, encourage people please to fill out that questionnaire and survey. We will share that with the commission amongst other people. Um, and try to make sure we get that information out there. And talk to your legislators, because as we know, this is a process that includes uh, things being approved by the legislation. So if you can make that case for why half a greenhouse is the right size for a small cultivator license, um, you know, start doing that now, um, if that's your thing. So, uh, like I said, we'll give you two or three more here uh, uh, from the crowd of folks, especially if you have something, a topic that we haven't hit on yet. Um, Please, so we'll do here and then we'll work our way over here and then we'll wrap it up. I have a question so I'm trying to put it together. Um, so I'm not an extracts guy, but I do know that extracts, extracts is the quickest expanding commodity in the industry. I also know that part of the profit margin, especially for a small cultivator, is going to be in finding ways to use our trim and bee buds. And the best way, it seems like the most profitable way, is in extracts. You guys decide to put a 30% cut on this. Um, am I going to have to find a different way to use my um, trim byproduct, and uh, or are we going to have to put a cutting agent in it? Sounds disgusting to me. I know the uh, the THC caps are a huge are a huge issue, and especially thinking about differentiating medical products with with consumer products as well so i think that's something that we definitely know is out there because right now it's 30 percent for flour and 60 percent for concentrate um, for adult use products not necessarily medical as far as the way that the laws are written and i think five milligrams would be the maximum dosage amount which it's crazy we haven't talked about edibles tonight with uh, this crowd and just sort of in general because that is such a huge thing but i will just throw it out there anybody who does extracting who's out there in the audience who wants to raise their hand if you're somebody who wants to talk more about it afterwards uh, because you run an extraction service um, and you want to network with people, feel free to throw your hands up now and promote yourself. There we go. There we go. Okay. I know we had a few other folks over here. Hi, I'm BJ from Stratford and my wife and I run Stratford Village Farms and I just wanted to ask, is there any preference going to go to people that are struggling farming right now? Because we know that farms are closing up in Vermont all the time, dairy farms are losing like crazy. That's a good way for you guys to make a really good impact on Vermont farms. I just want to keep that in mind. And I think social equity, social equity wise, right? I know this has been part of the, the consideration as far as how social equity applicants are, are defined. Um, and so I think, you know. Let's make that very clear. Social equity does not mean your skin color. It means whether you have been impacted in such a way by poverty or whatever, that you can make a claim for being raised to the list of priority contenders because of your social circumstances. You're raising the perfect argument I would want to make about why you should raise yourself on that priority list. Thank you. My name's Wes. Uh, I'm a farmer and I have, I've got a couple small businesses, both successful, some contractor, commercial fishermen. And uh, it was the lawyer that brought up this question for me is, 
are the applications available now if it's eight months from now? And do I need a lawyer to get one? Because, I mean, I feel like as a farmer, I've never had to hire a lawyer to open a business before. And I really don't want to do it now. I mean, it's, I mean we're, we're already, farmers are poor, right? We don't have a lot of money, and we we just want to do a little better for ourselves. So is this, is this something like, do I need to talk to you after after this meeting to find out whether or not I got to pay the bill? This is a great point. I'm not going to let I'm not going to let him answer that. So, <laughs> but I will say I, I think that is one of the lessons from the from the hemp program. It's something that the commission you know has to consider is that you know if it's successful enough that everybody can sign up for it and they get a thousand applicants, how does that how does that work on the ground, right? You know how long is it going to take to to hear back and things like that? Uh, because I know that the small cultivator license in particular seems like it's geared to be easier for you know for people to get it fill out, but um, yeah, I'll let I'll let I'll let Tim pitch him, pitch his services later, and anybody else who's in that in that field. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm Garth from the Kingdom here, and I was wondering to the board, um, like everybody has their favorite flavor, let's say purple train wreck. Um, in in uh, like here in the Kingdom, if a, if a place opened up, would the price be the same for purple train wreck here as, as down in Southern Vermont? And then also, what would be like the amount you could buy? Uh, I had a I have a Dominican friend who's lived in all five boroughs of New York City, and a place just opened up with a hundred different uh, varieties of strains, and you can only buy an eighth at a time. But if you want to buy five different strains, you can buy five eighths. So I'm just wondering if you guys thought of any, you know, the price and. Uh, you know the amount you could buy if that's come out yet. I think I think one ounce is all we know so far, right? Um, I think the law permits possession of up to two ounces right now before the civil penalties kick in. So we haven't made any decisions about you know caps on purchasing, but uh, you are legally allowed to possess up to two ounces. So um, it couldn't be more than that. Hey, good evening, guys. Thanks for uh, letting me ask this question here. Uh, my question has to do with um, the, so I'm kind of jumping back on this topic here of specific licenses and the number that we're all going to be allowed to have, which is one, right? Um, but, and I think I just want to make sure I understand what the senator said before that we're just in the beginning, is that correct? And that in the future it could be different for, for businesses. And the reason I ask is, is that as an entrepreneur who's trying to just do the retail side of it at this point, um, and having been in the local <coughs> have, you know, scene for a while, I think it's fair to say that everyone that's been really success successful doing it has had um, a business plan in which they were they were integrated. Uh, so if you're going to translate that over to the, to the THC side of it, you know, you would, the grower would be able to wholesale this stuff. Or, or also be able to process it on site, so on. You know, um, I know that the integrated licenses already exist for the big, for the big dispensaries, but um, I just would want to know if in the future it was open for for you know, mom and pop establishments to be able to be successful like they were then. I'm going to say to answer your question that this entire conversation is ongoing. Prove success. Come back. We expand. If you flop. The opposite happens. We are all walking very carefully. I'd like to address two other comments I heard. Wes, that was your name? Yeah. Wes, I love to eat. I can't bake a souffle. I drive a car, I ride a motorcycle, I've got some fun equipment, I'm not a mechanic. I go to a cook who knows how to make a souffle, I go to a mechanic who knows what they're doing with my equipment so I don't get into trouble. We have built in, in this system, an ability for people to get technical assistance in their application process. But this is very complicated stuff. If you gotta hire an attorney, that's what attorneys are there for. They become skilled in what they're looking at. I have no idea what your education level is. If you're the average person on the street, 
we hope we've provided you with the tools necessary to be able to get through that. But as we get more complicated as things go forward, I guarantee it's just like opening up any other business in the world, including a farm in this day and age. You're gonna to need to have somebody who has the expertise that you don't have. And that's why lawyers come into play. I wanna go back to a question over here about will X product cost the same here in Burke as it will in Brattleboro? Why should it? This beer cost me $7 here at Burke. If I go down to East Burke, Mike's Tiki Bar, I could probably get it for about five fifty. <laughs> So why would we want to standardize it across the country? This is actually a competitive market, and one of the ways we keep competing with that underground market is we keep competition in the game. So I hope you're not expecting that all of these things are going to be standardized, because we are literally walking through with baby steps, one step at a time, to make this try to work. But please understand, it's an ongoing conversation. We need in the legislature to sell to our colleagues your success. If you're having success, don't hesitate to approach a legislator, myself included, and say, look, we've done X, Y, and Z. Why can't we get from where we are now to where we could be? That's how this all works. And I wish you all the best of success in future endeavors be able to sell directly to consumers if possible. I know as you're saying, we're just getting started and we might not be able to right off, but down the road, and I don't know how to prove, prove success of that concept if we're not allowed to do it, but for example, I have people that come to my property and camp. I have tent platforms that camp. They see my hemp plants, they ask me questions about it, and then they've asked, hey, would you mind showing me around? So I'm gonna start offering tours show them around, talk to them about it. And I could see maybe, and I'm just barely getting started on all that myself, so I'm learning as I go, but maybe in the future I could be selling some products to those people um, directly and not having to go to Burlington and compete with everybody else in the state. You know, I've, I've done that before with hemp. I've gone, I've driven to Burlington two hours away with a backpack full of hemp and I've walked down Church Street gone to every single door, store shop and trying to sell my stuff and it's, it's hard, you know, there's, everyone's trying to sell there, so, I don't know, I just want to make that comment and help small people, small growers. Appreciate that. I know the direct to sales thing is something that we hear uh, a lot of and I know the, talk about event permits and I know when uh, alcohol initially craft breweries had the um, limited retail, right, so there are maybe some, some pathways um, that we looked at. All right, no pressure, you're the last one of the night. Uh, hi, um, thank you for your time, Mr. Paul. And um, I just wanted to touch back on testing. Um, while it is really important to address the financial aspect of um, accessibility to testing, um, I have a little experience in the Massachusetts cannabis industry on the CBD side of things, um, and have you know, seen the THC side of things too. And for testing, it seems like there's um, some timing issues, there's not always the capacity for testing. I think it's really important that if we're gonna have all these people growing and having to test it, um, to address who's gonna be testing it and how many, I don't know, I'm new to Vermont, um, so I don't know how many testing facilities are currently operating, um, but I think that that's a huge gap in this industry right now. There are a lot of people focused on that part of it, and I know that that's a cost thing, because the machinery is very expensive, but I think investment in that is going to be really important so we don't have people waiting on very time sensitive plant material being tested before they can actually process it um, to be used. So that's just something I think we need to be addressing too. All right, thank you all very much. I think uh, again at this point in the process it's, it's questions not answers and, and ideas um, and trying to get those ideas and uh, success stories I think as Senator Benning said uh, out to the, the right people. Um, I want to give a huge, huge, sincere thank you to our panelists who have all donated their time to, to be here this evening. And all the you all to, uh, to receive all of these questions to which we are all learning the answers together. 
Um, I want to encourage you all to please eat as many of those vegetables as you can. Um, it's actually part of the new COVID mandate. You all have to eat all that entire platter before we leave here. Uh, please tip your bartenders very generously. Uh, we really do appreciate Burke hosting us um, and remind everybody here, you're all adults, but please be good stewards of the grounds. Um, there's a beautiful parking lot right over there, far away from all the kids in the pools. Um, and again, just thank you all for participating. I encourage you to stay part of this discussion. Um, again, that questionnaire at vermontawan.com is super detailed. So things like how big the tiers should be, dollar amounts, other testing examples. Please get in there and spend as much time as you can or want to with those specific suggestions. Um, and I will spend the time and make sure that that input gets collected, it gets out there in the public, uh, and then gets distributed hopefully where it can be helpful. So um, thank you all again for participating. And thank you one more time to our panelists all for participating and sharing their time tonight. Sincerely appreciate you. Thank you.